Excellent. Now you, now you cannot see my secret comments. In which no, no, we cannot. Yes. I say complimentary things about everybody. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Yeah. Okay. So you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, Yuri. Um, thanks to uh, Jean and uh, to Florent and uh, everyone at ICTP for making uh, this workshop possible. Also, thanks to uh, all of the panelists for uh, really interesting talks and, and for all of our um, attendees joining from from around the world. This is fantastic. Um, okay, so, so my talk is going to be a little bit more statistics than um, uh, I think a lot of the talks that have seen uh, that that we've seen over the past uh, uh, day or day and a half. I'm going to talk about doing statistical inference with uh, with adaptively collected data. So uh, I want to start by by just showing you a very simple experiment. So this is an experiment from uh, from a data set. Uh, Yuri, can you just verify that the screen has changed? Yes, the so screen You changed. can see the next slide. Excellent. Yeah, we, we see um, the New England Journal of Medicine. Excellent. Uh, so, so, right. So this is a paper from, uh, as Yuri said, the New England Journal of Medicine. What they basically did uh, about, you know, nearly 12 years ago was to do what we would now call, you know, a Kaggle machine learning challenge. So they collected uh, a large data set of patients uh, who were prescribed to warfarin. Warfarin is uh, uh, very popular, particularly in, the, in North America. It's a very popular blood thinner. It's also a blood thinner that, that has uh, a high uh, uh, variance in therapeutic dose. So some people require very little of it. Some people require a lot of it um, to, to uh, get the therapeutic benefit. Uh, and it's fairly difficult to to compute the right uh, the right dose, and and uh, nurses and doctors spend spend a lot of time trying to um, uh, compute the right dose for people. What they did was to try and come up with a simple model, simple uh, model that can try and do this prediction task. So there's a, a large set of patients, about five thousand patients, and then they computed the the stable therapeutic dose of warfarin. These are the Ys. Um, and then they tried to fit uh, some function. Uh, in this case, it turned out that you know uh, the, the the linear model was was actually probably the best fit for predicting uh, the dose based on uh, the set of features or covariates that they had um, uh, about these patients. So, so one thought experiment that I wanted to do, which we'll see simulation results about, was that. Can we imagine what would have happened were this data collected in, in batches or were it collected uh, adaptively? So, so sort of imagine that you know, there was one batch of patients that came in, everyone didn't come in at the same time. Uh, there was one batch of patients that came in, uh, they went through the protocol, they, we found the right dose for them, but there was perhaps one patient, that's this red patient, didn't do well on the protocol. So the next time in the next batch, when the second set of patients came in uh, and you saw a patient that looked kind of like this red patient, you, you sort of replaced them with someone else uh, and then stuffed them through the protocol and then so on and so forth. Okay, so let's sort of imagine that instead of the data set just being collected uh, a little bit agnostically, this is kind of what happened. It is not, not completely unreasonable to imagine. Uh, one question that we might have is that, uh, okay, perhaps the model is still right, uh, but does this affect uh, statistical estimation? So, so do we still get consistent estimates of, of this uh, theta zero? What is the error rates and so on? Um, and more importantly, does this also affect uh, statistical inference? So can we compute confidence intervals, p-values, all of the usual stuff um, in the same way? Okay, uh, so so uh, this data set is available online, so you can you can download it and experiment. So that's exactly what I did. Uh, I'm going to sample from from this data set of patients about 10%, so 500 in in two different ways. So in the first way, I'm going to sort of mimic this adaptive data collection. So I'm going to sample half uh, of of my subsample, which is about 250 data points, uh, just uniformly at random, and then compute. You know, some theta hat based on this one. Say like this theta hat could be uh, just the least squares estimate on, uh, on these 250. And then uh, I'm going to sample the next set of 250, so the second half, uh, just from the top 15 percentile of the predicted dose. So I'm going to, uh, from the rest of the population, I'm just going to pick patients who need a high predicted uh, dose based on, on, on theta hat intermediate. Okay, 
So you can think of this as uh, a way of weeding out patients that might uh, that might uh, do worse on the protocol uh, that you have. Uh, and we we'll compare this with the sort of what we think of as as uh, as the ideal sort of statistically valid uh, data collection, which is just purely random data collection. So instead of this two-stage procedure, and that, uh, we'll compare this with just sampling the whole uh, uh, whole set of 500 uniformly at random. What we see uh, is if you compute, say, the least squares estimate on the whole data set in both the scenarios. Um, is, a, is a histogram of errors that looks like this. So in the first scenario, uh, the, the black uh, dashed line shows the true effect in both cases. Uh, in the first scenario of adaptive data collection, where we had this two-stage procedure, the uh, histogram of errors on the subsample uh, looks, uh, looks like this shape. So it's a bit shifted uh, off of the, of the true effect. Uh, whereas in the random subsample, it's centered entirely around the true effect. So, so I'll make two observations about this. Uh, one is that the uh, adaptive data collection doesn't seem to affect very much the size of the estimate, uh, estimator error. So the width of these two Gaussians looks roughly the same, um, but the estimator can be biased. So it's sort of shifted to the left, so, so the shape can change. Okay, so my goal for today is just to tell you about a very simple model for adaptive data collection, which uh, uh, which, which sort of captures these issues very well um, uh, uh, and, and makes them very clear. Uh, I'll tell you what we know from prior theory and sort of where is the point uh, in, in pre uh, earlier theoretical work where, where things fail. I'll tell you some, some ways we've thought of to remedy this. Um, then I'll end with some, some concluding thoughts on how this connects with other things that we know. Okay, so uh, the model is going to be very simple. It's going to be a linear model. So there's a parameter of theta zero. So this is something that we wish to infer from data. Uh, and then there's a sample of size n, uh, where y is linearly related to, to theta using covariance xi uh, with Gaussian noise, but the data is collected in two batches. So just two batches. Um, so this first, uh, in the first batch, uh, all of the data points are just chosen iid from some distribution piece of x. Uh, based on uh, these x's, you observe the corresponding y's, and then you compute an estimate theta hat from it. For a concreteness, let's say theta hat is the least squares estimate based on the first m data points. Uh, and then uh, the rest of the data points, uh, m plus one through n, uh, you, uh, are just biased um, samples of x. So you can think of important sampling x, so that uh, x uh, and uh, the, the, the bias sample of x Fra has at least some correlation uh, with theta hat, with this intermediate estimate theta hat that's computed on the first batch. So there's just sort of one point of adaptivity, which is the point at which you compute uh, this intermediate estimate in the middle, which happens uh, after m data points. Okay, so there's sort of, uh, I think, a couple of reasons to focus on this model. One is that it's very simple, but it also uh, approximates sort of well-known bandit algorithms and what we think of adaptive clinical uh, adaptive designs that people um, do in medicine as well. So it's it's not it's not a bad model to begin with anyway. Uh, and more importantly, I think it captures this this key issue of adaptively collected data, which is that future data or future data points that we get to see depend on past outcomes. And this is we'll see is the main problem. Okay, so so what does prior theory say? Uh, so you know, there's, there's a lot of work on this, but, but I'll summarize it in, in sort of two points. Uh, the first is that um, the, the, the consistency, so if you just compute the least squares estimate on the full data set, under fairly mild conditions, this has good error properties. So, so you get essentially the, the dimension over n error rate that you sort of expect. Um, but the, the distributional properties of this uh, of this estimate are not what you'd expect. So although this is essentially doing an average of data points simply because the data collection is itself biased, it need not be the case that uh, theta hat is itself uh, uh, unbiased and Gaussian as you'd expect. So you need an additional condition, which is uh, what Lai and Wei call stability. So what this means is that the, the the sample covariance is essentially deterministic. So it concentrates very well 
uh, around a deterministic quantity. In the case that the data collection procedure happens to be stable, then in addition to the consistency properties, you have uh, also that uh, theta hat is, is, um, is going to be Gaussian with, with, with the covariance that you expect. So yes, and then there is no log n, right? Uh, no, the log n is still there. Uh, it's uh, the log n is is a little bit hidden within within the sample covariance. Uh, so so uh, you know the the main key point is that sort of uh, the error rates are relatively robust to adaptive data collection, but the distributional theory is is sort of not. And if the, you want to compute uh, p values or confidence intervals, this is a problem. Um, how this connects, uh, you know. The, the first uh, sort of simple, relatively simple observation, and this this connects to to uh, the topic of our workshop, which is that you know, in some sense, the high dimensionality of of the data set is related to uh, what we uh, to this lack of stability. So uh, you can prove that um, the least squares estimate. Um, you could take a sort of simple counter example where px is standard normal, then the bias of the least square estimate is essentially proportional to the original theta zero uh, up to, um, so uh, with, with, with the proportionality constant that depends on, on p over n. Okay, uh, so when will the bias be negligible? The bias is negligible if p over n is uh, smaller than the standard deviation, which is of order one over square root of n. Um, and if you do the calculation, it ha this happens only if n is much bigger than p squared. Okay, but if we believe the the uh, uh, the error rates before, the consistency only needs n is at least p log p. Okay, so there's a gap here that basically appears only if uh, the dimension, you know, is is comparable uh, with n reasonably. Okay, so so this is sort of uh, and this is the key reason why why you see the bias appearing uh, in the simulations that we saw earlier. Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, go over uh, a, a very uh, solution to this, uh, uh, and and uh, to to motivate this, I'll go through one step, which which we call say predictable estimator. So let's just think that we have we're back in dimension one. So instead of being high dimensional, we're back in dimension one, and we wanted to compute uh, an estimate of of theta zero, which is now just a scalar. We started with linear estimates. Why should we change? Let's still compute a linear estimate. Uh, so for any set uh, of weights w i that correspond to the outcomes, you can use uh, the model equation. Um, and, and write theta hat as the truth plus something that's proportional to the th truth plus something that's proportional to the noise. Um, this is true for any set of weights w. It's just um, an algebraic identity. There's nothing smart happening here. Uh, but let's try and isolate the bias. So in particular, let's try and make sure that the bias is, is just in the first term. So if we think that um, wi's um, are, are constructed online. So wi is only a function of data that is seen up to time i, then by definition, it is going to be uh, that epsilon i is independent of wi. So this uh, term looks basically like a random walk. What that means is whatever the bias in, in theta hat must concentrate uh, on uh, in the first term. So the bias is going to be whatever appears with this choice of uh, wi in the first term. Uh, and then the variance is given by, by uh, the second part. Of course, uh, this is sort of a simple uh, idea. The, the key point is that we still haven't really chosen the wi's. We've just come up with one desiderata, which is the fact that they must be uh, sort of chosen uh, over time with respecting the time ordering of the data. Uh, deep biased estimators are just a step on this. Uh, it's a small twist where you, uh, where you simply uh, do this on the error rather than uh, the estimate itself. It's not very crucial. The calculations are very much the same. So I'll skip that. Uh, and you, know, you can think of many ways of constructing the weights subject to the desiderata that, were, that, that I mentioned. Yes, one minute. Yeah. Uh, so um, what, what we do in the paper is simply something that uh, optimizes bias and variance. 
So uh, think that you've chosen all of the weights up to time uh, i minus one, you choose the ith weight to trade off the bias and variance. Uh, this is the equation in dimension one. Uh, in higher dimensions, it's not particularly hard uh, to generalize this. Uh, the interesting thing uh, I think is, 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 you know, say this is the sort of theorem that you can prove about it that under mild conditions and essentially just the consistency criterion on uh, the sample complexity, the debiased estimate is going to be Gaussian. Uh, with, with variance that is order one, as you'd expect. Uh, the important uh, thing is that this the stability condition that's required for the data collection process is actually built in into this deep bias estimate. So you don't really need it as an additional assumption. All you need is that the original pilot estimate uh, is stable. Um, you need something uh, uh, to decide the regularization, but I'll skip that in the interest of time. Uh, recall that let's go back and see whether this actually works. So this is the uh, this is the, the the histogram of the errors that we had for the standard least squares estimate. What happens if we um, do the debiasing? You get the the uh, the blue histograms on top, and as you can see, this is uh, this corrects automatically the bias at the price uh, of a little bit of variance, now, which uh, one can show is also uh, necessary. But I'll skip that. Um, okay, I'll skip the normalized errors um, uh, as well as this. So um, I think to conclude, I'll, I'll, I'll just make a few points. Uh, you know, I think we have, uh, uh, I've, thinking about, we've been thinking about online debiasing as, as sort of this robust and flexible wrapper for inference. Uh, you, I, I presented it in the context of least squares estimation, but you can do uh, we have a paper that does uh, this with the lasso, so multiple things can be done. We're also working on uh, nonlinear models. Um, uh, the, the, the sort of key learning or the key insight or, or the, 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 the key difficulty is to try and understand what data do we get to see. Uh, so you have to imagine the population from which the data comes from. It's not entirely, uh, and that's why uh, the issue crops up. And this is also something that uh, appears in a lot of other related problems in bandits, reinforcement learning, and causal inference. Um, and I think for myself, one of the important learnings was that modeling data provenance is, is crucial for providing valid inferential guarantees. And, and I hope it's something that we in the theory community pay more attention to uh, as time goes on. Thank you.